All right, everyone, I, I think we're ready to begin. My name is Doug Mullen. I'm the executive director of JSGS. And the Johnson Shamma Graduate School of Public Policy is the product of a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. It was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines our province. The two universities established the School for Advanced Study and Research in Public Policy and Administration. I want to welcome our guests joining us here today in Saskatoon and those joining us by Zoom. We're discussing today the state of democracy in 2019 and we're thinking about it in a global sense. At this time, I'd also like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 land in the traditional home of the Métis. I'll provide some brief introductions and each of our panelists will have about 12 minutes to speak. Following all presentations, we'll be, uh, we'll be open for the, the floor to, for questions and answers. For those in Regina and Saskatoon, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you and we will alternate between uh, locations. I, mean, I think there's a small number in Saskatoon, so it'll likely be focused mainly here. For those joining us by Zoom, please unmute your mic and wait to be acknowledged or submit your question via the text box on the right side of your screen. Um, so I'm pleased to be able to introduce our panelists. Uh, the first speaker today will be John White. And John has a distinguished career as a constitutional law professor. He's held law chairs at a number of Canadian universities, but his chief academic home has been at Queen's University, where he also served as Dean of Law. He was Director of Constitutional Law in the Saskatchewan AG's de Department during the constitutional patriation process, and was Saskatchewan's Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General from 1997 to 2002. He's a professor emeritus at Queen's and at the University of Regina. The second speaker will be Jim Farney. Jim is the department head and associate professor with politics and international studies at the University of Regina. Jim's primary research interests are Canadian party politics, political institutions, and religion and politics. He's the author of Social Conservatism and Party Politics in Canada and the United States, and editor with David Rayside of Conservatism in Canada as well as a number of book chapters and journal articles on those topics. He's currently working on a book examining the different ways that Canadian provinces fund and regulate religious schools, an edited volume on Canadian federalism with Judy, Julie Simons at Guelph, and projects on Canadian party politics with Royce Coop in Manitoba. Our third speaker will be Cheryl Camillo. Cheryl wanted to be a medical doctor until she read William Golding's Lord of the Flies in grade nine which was a, a, a politics and literature class, after which she became more interested in figuring out how to make people healthier about politics and, and, and policy. She got an undergraduate degree in political science from Yale, a Master of Public Administration degree from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, and a PhD in public policy uh, 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 recently from the University of Maryland. She served in most roles of the public policy uh, making process, including grassroots organizer, lobbyist, senior federal policy advisor, state health program executive and now assistant professor and director of the Johnson Shama's Master of Health Administration program. And during her career, she's seen a, groups of positively motivated individuals achieve the seemingly impossible. So she's cautiously optimistic, unlike John White. Uh, and, and then, uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> Bruno uh, Desprion. De De Bruno is a, an associate professor and graduate chair at JSGS. His major research interests are border and immigration issues using political sociology and comparative perspectives. Bruno's research focuses on two streams, the transformations of cross-border governance in North America and Europe, and the regulation of mobility and security in North America. He's currently working on an international research project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And in addition to his role in the school, Bruno is a an associate researcher at the research chair on the immigration, ethnicity, and citizenship at the University of Quebec at Montreal. So, if we could, I'll ask John to take it away for the, for the next few minutes. Thank you, John. Some people shouldn't be allowed to participate in things. Um, so, uh, I want largely to talk about America, although Doug in his introduction said that really wasn't our focus. And I want to talk about America because I hold the view that if American democracy collapses, 
the spirit around the world for tyranny and the political success that it can bring will be even more irrepressible and that democracy will flounder globally for some time until another age. I don't know how long an age is, but at least another age. A year ago, I was asked by Iowa State University to go there and talk uh, at their First Amendment conference, and uh, I suggested I would talk uh, on will um, democracy survive, and I did. And uh, I, uh, by the time I gave the talk, I had so offended my American hosts by Doug's identified pessimism, and also, by the way, by saying that the First Amendment probably did more harm to social solidarity than, than almost anything by allowing and protecting intemperate, destructive cleavage making and t t contemptuous speech uh, without any check around uh, broader social interests, which is actually pretty much like going to a synod meeting of some famous church and telling them, you do know that there is no God. Um, and uh, so, uh, but when I got to the lecture on will democracy survive, I had some obligation to be a little more upbeat. So at the end, I did two things. I, um, I re gave a report card to America uh, on its democracy, and it passed. Um, and uh, secondly, I quoted from that great Canadian poet, Leonard Cohen, uh, in his uh, in his uh, poem, democracy is coming to the USA, and um, and I, I said that in a way I could believe the Cohen idea about democracy coming to the USA. Democracy is coming to the USA. It's coming to America first, the cradle of the best and the worst. It's here they got the range and the machinery for change. It's here the family is broken. It's here the people say, the heart has got to open in a fundamental way. Democracy is coming to the USA. And this is a tremendously hopeful lyric because it says that when there is suffering, political suffering and social suffering, Americans will respond. Respond with anger and respond with reform and will transform the pathologies of their society into something which is more beneficial. And when they want to do that, there is the machinery. There is the rule of law. There is the free press. There is an opposition. There is separation of powers. There are the things that make it possible to challenge tyranny in America. And so that was a very encouraging thing. Today, no, I'm not encouraged. And I am worried that American democracy is on the cusp, that, and, and the feeling about American democracy on the cusp, really, it gets accentuated by the fascist practice of rallying. The rallying, the process by which people are brought together to hear what they desperately need to hear, and what they ne need to hear are lies, and they're told lies, and their democ democratic participation then is governed by a belief system which is built for them on fraud and suspends critical judgment and in a way destroys the very foundation of democracy which is the foundation is political choice. Political choice based on some reasonable understanding of what the situation is, what the choices are, what the consequences are of what is chosen. Lying goes to the core of democracy's frailty. It is produced by an incredible lust for power in which almost anything is usable to arrive at the situation of holding power and anything is usable in order to sustain support over time. It is, and I've said this before, it is deeply corrupting and it is hard to overcome a pattern of lying, a pattern of rallies, a pattern of uncritical participation in thought processes that make democracy possible is hard to correct. There are other things that are hard to correct, although they could be corrected, and again, I'm still in America. <laughs>
One is the systematic exclusion of voters from participation through suppression of vote, through the identification of people whose capacity to vote is held in contempt and are excluded from voting by rigorous application of discriminatory qualifications for voting. Another thing that happens in America is gerrymandering, the dilution of a vote fourfold in some places from, with, with, in, in elections by uh, putting people in, in, in constituencies where their vote could not matter less uh, and uh, putting slightly weighted, I'm going to say conservative Republican votes in more marginal seats. This is a dilution of democracy of the first order. A dilution of democracy is also the construction of a news environment in which one news network is a party of a party uh, so that news then becomes a contest of ideology, not a contest of professionalism. And when journalism loses its professionalism, journalism loses itself. And then without journalism, there is really no free speech. There is really no foundation for democracy. These are serious, serious problems. Are they to be saved by the structures of accountability that America enjoys? The rule of law. Well, if we exclude the Supreme Court of the United States, we might say yes. Trump is periodically held up in his restrictions of uh, Islam entrance. Uh, he's held up with respect to the treatment of illegal migrants across the Mexican-American border. Uh, and so there is a rule of law process going on which arrests him slightly, but there is also the problem of the Supreme Court of the United States, the identification of a court with a party in a wholesale way. Uh, it is something that exists as a risk in every high court, in any nation. It has to be appointed by something. But most nations are assiduous in trying to sustain the legitimacy of the court because the court may prove to be useful. Mr. Trump has no interest in sustaining the legitimacy of the court and the court's usefulness still continues, which is, I think, a significant sign of the erosion of democracy in America. There are other things that seem to be problematic, but these are matters which are deep. They're, they've become endemic. Are they correctable? Well, maybe there's impeachment. There is the court, and there are elections. And all of those are at play, at least in people's minds. And by the way, there's an investigation in criminal law. All of these are at play in people's minds, and they may well suppress American democracy, Trump, Trump's attack on American democracy, and they may not. My view is that when America loses, if America loses its democracy, if it becomes a state held in thrall to a certain kind of contemptuous politics, the erosion of legitimacy of large sections of the population in their place in the political state, it will unleash a dis, a dis favor of democracy widely in the world. There's plenty of fertile ground for this to grow on across the world, perhaps most notably in America. The other thing that might be said about this issue of democracy is that we wonder about the causes of Trumpism, and I know Jim Farney is going to talk a little bit about the causes of the reduction of commitment to democratic principles or the 
overwhelming of democratic principles by the grievance of people, by the people whose entitlement has been seeded badly and who watch people who are patently less uh, laudable being recognized as legitimate. Um, I w this is the co and, and, I, and certainly uh, supply side budgets uh, ha have produced a high cost as so, ha so has neoliberal trade agreements. Um, but I want to talk about one other thing and that is that democracy is based on one principle that the division between rulers and the ruled is destroyed. There is only one class of person called the citizen. And the citizen chooses who it is to rule, and the citizen claims human rights against the state in a liberal democracy. The creation of division, the creation of contemptuous status, the, the, the creation of persons who are not entitled to respect politically is the very antithesis of democracy. Following the Civil War, Walt Whitman wrote a book uh, called Democracy Vistas. And he said, I had so much hope for the outcome of the war that the divisions that made America weak, vulnerable, immoral, were eradicated by the most impressive display of state power to stand up for the, illeg the legal and hopefully the actual equality of all people. So there is no division between those who can rule, those who are entitled, and those who can't rule, and those who are disentitled. And I am deeply disappointed. We have not recovered our democracy because of the greediness, because of the contemptuousness because of the power of people to seek their own best interests and to eschew the underlying hope of democracy that it will be a nation in which people's dominant aspiration is to do good for one another. So John is a is a hard act to follow, and I'm unfortunately under completely non-deniable because these folks still work on telephones instructions to disagree with them. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, they actually Car uh, Cheryl and, and Doug were a bit more pointed. They said, you know, do you think you would defend Trump in the panel that's coming up? And I said, no, I can't go that far, but. I'd like to survive to teach the afternoon class after, but I'm going to come as close to it as I can. Uh, and I think much of it, I'm going to take three positions. Um, what pins them all together is, is, I think, the argument that we have to be careful what we mean when we speak about democracy. And I think what's going on right now, I mean, American Election Administration is always a bit fraught, but that's kind of a constant. What's globally more problematic and has people more worried is maybe not democracy, but the things we usually associate with it and the relationship between those things and democracy or, and democratic institutions. I'm thinking of things such as individual rights, the rule of law, capitalism, however you want to understand it, and the nation state. And I would argue with Brexit, and with Trump, with the alt-right, um, the further east in Europe you go, the sh shadier my knowledge starts to get. What's, what's in play is a reconfiguration of how we've balanced those things off. And uh, an unsettling of the post-Cold War consensus that they all fit together without any, any uh, problems. So one position I want to take. Is it possible that Trump, the Brexiters, the alt-right, are correct that some big political questions have not been addressed democratically in the last 25 years. As examples, I would give the relative decline of the West in economic and foreign policy terms, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, but Asia generally. Particularly in the US, but also true in other countries, the increasing 
economic, educational, geographic isolation of elite decision makers from ordinary people, I think the cause of much of the populist backlash. The reality that the economic benefits of globalization exist, but have been very unevenly distributed. And that we have moved through a dramatic period of cultural change with reference to the status of women, of sexual minorities, of ethnic and visible minorities throughout the West. I think all of those statements are true. And with the exception of Canada and the US and Mexico around NAFTA, I would argue that most of those have not been the result of contested elections fought out over those issues. And so it's perhaps reasonable, even if the folks advancing them are unreasonable, that the population on both the left and the right say we need to maybe assess and debate um, as Democrats what our answers to these things are. So that's w one position. And I would argue that I think, although I wish the British Parliament was doing a better job this week of supporting me in this, I think these are things that are core democratic institutions. Parliament, or Congress, parties, the bureaucracy can do. The second position, though, is that where we are vulnerable is when we try to uh, match that stuff up with commitments to individual rights and the rule of law, which I think is why immigration, for example, is so difficult. Um, the broad scope of, of economic inequality that's been growing um, and of changing industrial mixes. And what to do with this thing that we've been able to take for granted in the West, the nation state, as our societies become more diverse. None of those things are democratic things. They might be liberal, they might be just, they might be natural, but they have nothing to do with translating the will of the people into policy action or political direction. Um, and I think why Trump troubles people like department's heads in political science and former heads of Queen's Law is that he doesn't take direction on the liberal side. Right? He's a profoundly illiberal Democrat in his instincts. And that bothers us. But I'm not sure that it should if what we're talking about is democracy. So we have, I would agree, vulnerabilities there. I'd also... Um, worry a little bit, and this, this is riffing off but extending a point that John made, I worry about the set of incentives we have for what I'll call the commentating classes, in which I include myself, to narrow cast and focus on cases of institutional failure. Because we're, all, we're very puzzled in the literature on why the population doesn't trust institutions. But when you look at the daily practice of academics and journalists, basically what we do is we point out the flaws in institutions, rightly or wrongly, but it's a, it's a good business. You do that for a couple of generations, and then you turn around and ask, well, why is it that people under 25 don't trust democracy? And at least part of the argument, I think, should be clear. That point, I think, highlights or is a caution for a really important empirical reality, which is... There's never been so much democracy in the world, but there's never been so little trust in it. If you look at polity data or the world value study, there's a really odd disconnect there that's breaking out politically in the last five years. And I think that, that disconnect is, is part of why we're talking today. Okay, third position. Um, if I'm not worried about democracy itself, I'm worried about our perceptions of it and its linkage to other things. Um, where do I, if, if, if I was forced to say, what would I go looking for for solutions? I do think this lack of trust is, is critical. Um, I'm not sure if changing how the media operates would fix it wholesale. This is a set of generational changes that's very widespread and quite well documented. But the fact that people do not trust their own institutions is clearly a problem. There's also, I think, um, a question of what I'll call institutional efficacy. We expect more and more out of our political institutions. Um, and 
I sometimes wonder if we expect things they cannot deliver. Uh, and to me, the extreme example was um, when Prime Minister Trudeau quite strongly implied the, the investigation into missing and murdered Aboriginal women would bring healing. I'm not sure a Prime Minister can promise that. He can promise a lot of other things on that file and should. But can you promise healing to families? We have a set of incentives for politicians of all parties and types to promise something like healing or like feeling better. Um, I don't think we can deliver on that institutionally. So I don't think we should focus just on Trump and the Brexit folks. I think there's a set of, of systematic institutional vulnerabilities, not around core institutions of democracy, but around the linkage to other stuff and the worry about trust. With that said, I'm curious to see how Cheryl, who is kind of our American politics expert, is, is optimistic. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to talk about what I th think are short-term solutions to overcoming the tyranny that John talked about, and then, and then a longer-term solution to overcome the fact that, that there is this Bill of Rights in the U.S. Uh, that Americans hold on to so strongly and will never let go of, and and how America could go forward and hopefully not lapse back into, into a state of almost tyranny that it is now um, and, and be the paragon of democracy for the world that it, that it has in the past aspired to be and still thinks it is um, in, in many cases. Before I do that, I, I am going to address a few of the causes of the state right now that uh, elaborate a little bit on building on what John suggested. Um, but before I do that, I want to ask a couple questions to to get a sense of how familiar you are with the American political scene. How many of you can name a candidate who has declared for the presidency in 2020? So I see at least half of the hands in the room went up. How about, how many of you can name one of the 12 appropriations bills that must pass the US Congress every year for the government to be funded? Nobody. <laughs> I'll come back to why I asked that question in a few minutes. John talked about the neoliberalism and in its impact on democratic societies, particularly the US. and. I would agree with him that that is one of the forces that that has uh, result that has has d disrupted the balance there, so that um, there is more individualism than than ever in the country. And I'll I'll give you an example of that. The messaging has 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 become more and more common over the last say 10 to 15 years, to the point where about 10 to 15 years ago in the Washington DC subway system, the authority that runs the system, which is, which is um, consists of the governments of Washington DC, the state of Virginia, and the state of Maryland, as well as the federal government, decided that when making public announcements, which happen all the time on that metro system, they would no longer refer to the users of the system as passengers, but they would call them customers. And that seems like a subtle change, but yet when these changes are happening all around, it sends a message that you as a person are not one traveler on this public conveyance, that you're using something that's there for everyone, but in fact, you are an individual who's paying to get something out of this. So you are buying a piece of it. And that, I believe, has been one of the reasons that there are increasing levels of narcissism in the country. Multiple studies have been, have been done, some focusing on Americans, but some focusing on, on citizens of other countries. And the, the, the incredible rate at which levels of narcissism um, are increasing is pretty astounding to the point where I think the last study showed that something like six to eight percent of Americans have 
a, a clinical level of narcissism. And if you add to that that there's this celebrity culture that, that is growing stronger every day, studies also show that this is the case that more and more people are hungry to make and admire and watch celebrities. That, that um, fuels the individualism so that if somebody like a, a Donald Trump can um, feel that he can tip the balance and instead of having a system that's, that's meant to balance the different perspectives in the country and basically seesaw back and forth between them, that he can control the seesaw completely. The reason I asked if, if you were aware of who's declared to run for the presidency in 2020 is, is, is to get a sense of whether or not um, what's, what's true in the US is true here, that Americans are now thinking of politics and policy, you know, basically of governance and political life as about, about individuals and putting all of their attention and stock in individuals to do the right thing by everybody as opposed to thinking of the entire system, the, the, not only the elected representatives, but the policy making process and all the um, civil organizations that are part of governing a country. And, um, but, and, and so those I think are, are things that we need to overcome and I'll, and I'll get back to those when I talk about long-term solutions. John talked about the Civil War. The U.S. did survive a civil war that, that um, was incredibly bloody. If, if you journey outside of Washington, D.C. and you walk the battlefields of Antietam or Bull Run, um, it's pretty profound because hundreds of thousands of soldiers died on those battlefields. But the U.S. overcame that. And since World War II, uh, the U.S. has, has um, overcome several institutional or internal injustices. There have been at least, by my assessment, four very successful social movements. There was the civil rights movement. There was the movement by people with HIV and AIDS to, to get their medical needs treated. There's the lesbian and gay rights movement and also recently a disability rights movement. And all have been successful in making real, at, at least to this point, lasting change in the country. And I think it's because they are utilizing one part of the institutional apparatus that we haven't talked about today. I would say when I think of uh, American democracy, but I think this is true of other uh, democracy in other countries, other forms other than the, the American one, that there are really four mechanisms for the citizens to utilize. One is the vote. John talked a little bit about that. The second is to be involved in the policy making process through your representatives, through trying to influence your representatives. The third is being involved in the political and the policy making processes through civil society, through organizations that, that you might be a member of. And uh, sometimes those institutions are weak and they're weakened. And we saw certainly back in the, in, um, prior to the civil rights movement that African Americans were denied the right to vote. And it took uh, quite a bit of effort to change that. John's talked about gerrymandering. Sometimes when lobbying on policy issues as a citizen or a member of civil society, you uh, might have limited effectiveness sometimes because of uh, corruption or the, the unwillingness of, of a particular political party. I think many would argue now that the, the Republican Party is uh, in lockstep with with, with President Trump and particularly the, the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, um, will not follow the, pro the institutional processes of the Senate to allow real policy making to happen. And, and that's where this fourth institution comes in and it's really important and has long roots in the United States, which is civil disobedience, which Martin Luther King defined as making, um, uh, raising something to a crisis situation and producing tension for the purpose of stimulating discussion about issues. And 
it's very, and I've, I characterize it as very much part of American institutions because the act of civil disobedience, and, and by definition I'm talking about nonviolent actions, um, are showing incredible respect for the law. Someone who's engaging in civil disobedience, say at a lunch counter at a Woolworths in North Carolina, is saying to the law authorities, I respect the fact that, that you have asked me to leave and you have the right to ask me to leave, so I will put out my hand so that you can handcuff me because I, I think that law should stay in the books and I respect that law and I understand that I have to go to jail to make this bigger point about whether or not segregation is the right thing to do. And while current in the US since um, Donald Trump was uh, moved into the White House, I'll say moved into the White House because there's questions about, about whether he was truly uh, elected or not. Um, the, the, the forces who are concerned about the strength of the democratic institutions have, have tried to use the vote and, and have been very active in lobbying their representatives to change policies or to protect policies that Trump has sought to change sometimes in an extra constitutional way. They've had some effectiveness with that, um, but in other cases they haven't. One, one recent um, case where they haven't been effective is, is Trump's declaration that building a wall is in the national interest and, and it's a national emergency. Many believe that that, that uh, uh, was con um, contravened the Constitution and he exceeded the authority he has under the Constitution. And in, in civil society has certainly been very, very active. The, the Women's March, the first Women's March, is one of the largest marches ever in the US. And not only was it a, one of the largest marches on Washington, D.C., but it happened in 500 other cities at, this, at the same time. Um, but what we haven't seen is people wanting to um, go that extra step and really um, make themselves uncomfortable in the interest of overthrowing tyranny and make others uncomfortable as well in a, in a civilly disobedient way. There have been some cases where uh, some individuals have been arrested outside of a congressman's office, say Mitch McConnell's office, but what we, what we haven't seen is a lot of sustained campaigns of pressure to make that happen. Um, and, but I do think if, if that were to take place, that that would be very effective. I can tell you that, um, it give you some examples of, of where it's been effective and, and how it does, does make people think. Back in 1999, I worked for the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who is the equivalent of the Federal Minister of Health here in Canada. And it was a rainy, kind of chilly spring day in Washington, D.C. And the word started getting out around 9 o'clock in the morning that we've all been locked in the building. What happened is there's a group called ADAPT, which is a disabilities rights group. And they descended upon the headquarters building, which is right on the National Mall, and locked themselves to every single door of the building. And um, there was no way we could get in or out all day long. They even somehow managed to lock themselves in the tunnel that connects our building with another building across the street. And I was talking with our senior science policy officials about it, and those two officials had previously worked at the National Institutes of, of Health at a time in the, in the early 90s when AIDS activists were pushing hard for the government to do more to, to help with the development of drugs to treat HIV and AIDS. And uh, the group at the time, ACT UP, had descended upon the National Institutes of Health, which is a campus bigger than the University of Regina campus, and completely shut it down by taking signs like this and taping them to the windows of buildings in, in the institute and chanting and, and, um, and basically engaging in nonviolent theater. And what was interesting is the bureaucrats I was talking to were talking about that incident that had happened eight years ago with an incredible amount of admiration and awe, even though these were people who were lifelong bureaucrats and scientists, uh, because when the National Institutes of Health was shut down, 
um, because this was part of a sustained series of actions to shut down health and human services buildings to get to get the officials to address the AIDS crisis, NIH changed the whole process of conducting clinical trials in the U.S., which is no small feat. The Federal Food and Drug Administration also changed the way it reviewed drugs and the way drugs were priced, so it lowered the price of drugs. And that's why today we see that people who've had HIV since 1983 are still alive today. It's because of those civil disobedient actions. So I, I, I think there is hope. Um, and the last thing I'll say, because I, um, I, I'm over my time now, is if we can get through this short term and restore some of the balance here, then, then long term, I think the way we, we try to, to pre prevent a slide back into this type of tyranny is to, uh, and this is applicable outside of the United States, is to engage in discussions with the thinking about we, always with the pronoun we and citizens, um, and thinking about the greater good of the citizens and policy issues. It's, it's easier said than done, but I think we need to focus on, on the we, even when we're talking about how to write justices or implement policies to address the needs of a particular groups of people. Thank you very much. Um, so for, for someone like me who studies uh, borders and uh, migrations, uh, democracy is an interesting beast uh, because democracies have to balance uh, the principle of sovereignty, especially territorial sovereignty, and human rights. So territorial sovereignty uh, can mean, for instance, who has access to our territory, uh, what are the rights of foreigners, what about vulnerable uh, people who want to have access to our territory, for instance, asylum seekers? And what are the rights of our citizens, of course, but also what are the rights of non-citizens? So for me, the health uh, of a democracy is reflected deeply in the way we treat uh, migrants uh, and uh, asylum seekers. And this is basically the lenses I'm going to to use uh, today. So here we can see uh, a, a map of uh, the early um, 1900s. And the reason why you have a map here, and you all have too many slides, I apologize in advance. But for me, it's hard not to consider democracies with their former colonial empires, as well as their remains, which are other forms of empires. And those empires were useful to outsource, for instance, socioeconomic, criminal, and political burdens. For instance, Australia is being well known, uh, was being a well known penal colony, similarly to Cayenne in French Guiana. And you can see that you had there the mobility of people, as well as poor people from Britain to Canada, uh, sponsored by charitable organizations in the late. Uh, 19th and early 20th century. So in this context here of um, empires, mobility was restricted based on ethno-racial, economic and gender categories. And immigration policies in the British Empire were openly racist. So you have here uh, how the Prime Minister uh, of New Zealand in 1907 framed this mobility problem in New Zealand saying that New Zealand white was a white man's country. And Canada, of course, was not exempt from this trend. Canadian immigration policies were restrictive and exclusionary as well. The Chinese head tax is uh, one famous example, and also the ship of Jewish, uh, Jewish refugees, the Mount St. Louis, being turned away in 1939, is another one. So fast forward, uh, here we can see uh, the number of immigrants and the immigration rate uh, of Canada between 1852 and uh, 2012, so it's a long period of time. But, and here the problem is that we don't see the Canadian immigration policies that changed dramatically along with other Western democracies in the 60s and uh, 70s. So instead of selecting only white European immigrants, Canada decided to recruit uh, 
qualified immigrants and limit the influx of unskilled workers. So this contributed to open the gates to qualified immigrants from non-European countries as well. And moreover, at the same time, around the, in the 70s, refugees were defined as a distinct category of immigrants, which received broad social and political support at the time. And in this context, the current multicultural policy that we have here in Canada seeks to recognize the cultural contribution of diverse ethnic groups to the Canadian society. But we do notice here in this figure that the immigration rate in the last 40 years has been remarkably stable, less than 1% a year, less than 1%. So Canada, of course, is relatively privileged uh, since, we can, since we can easily select, choose, or discriminate our immigrants. Other countries do not easily select who gets in, but they are still in control since current numbers of international migrants do not reflect a crisis at all. So here you can see that in the mustard rectangle, Oh, sorry, lower the mic. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, we see in the mustard rectangle that international migrants as percentage of total world population has slightly increased from 2.8% in 2000 to 3.4% in 2017. So if in a room there are a bit more than 30 people, only one individual is an international migrant, which means that 29 people do not move on earth. They stay where they are. So this increase is based, in fact, over the last 15, 20 years on the mobility of people who can afford to move internationally. For instance, people from high income countries and middle upper class people from less developed uh, countries. And those are the people that are typically selected by Canada. But in this context, if international migration remains stable and controlled, then what is the threat that many people see in immigrants? And here you can see a typical threat on the US-Mexico border, a giant piñata. Um, um, and of course here, uh, I try to joke because there is no threat, there is no problem. The trend of undocumented immigrants is at the lowest in the past 20 years, and not because of the Trump administration, but because of a long a declin declining trend in the past 20 years. So uh, the pseudo threat then results in absurd policy initiatives, such as this one, the edification of world prototypes, which are destroyed a few months later. And so the question is, do Walls work to restrict immigration flows, drug smuggling, and so on? And the short answer is no. So if we want to protect our democracies, is the answer to build walls? No, it doesn't work. And so the question you will ask me is why? Well, here you have one explanation. Asylum seekers, for instance, need to interact with border officers to claim asylum. So. Of course, fancies help to know where border officers can be found. And besides, fortifying a border does not work for other reasons. First, the vast majority of undocumented migrants in the US get into the country legally, and they just simply overstay their visa. So having a wall is absolutely uh, useless. Secondly, smuggling drugs is done through official ports of entry more than 80% of drugs are through, you know, uh, generally land uh, ports of entry. And finally, criminal organizations thrive because of those harsher policy measures. Human trafficking, for instance, is a growing business uh, for Mexican and Central American uh, criminal organizations. Of course, with uh, important risks of abuses for women and children in particular. So one question for our democracies is how do we treat undocumented migrants and asylum seekers? So often we make sure that human rights are not universal, and this is here an example. Although, of course, um, 
uh, people in uh, the United States um, also contribute to the defense of those uh, migrants and uh, undocumented uh, and asylum seekers. And you can see here the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, Nielsen, who recently explained to a congresswoman that cages for detained children are not cages, but detention spaces. And she added that uh, those are not comparable to, those, to dog cages because they are larger than dog cages. So, Brexit is another interesting example of immigration policy and immigrants instrumentalized for political gains. And I think that those racist and extremist uh, views on immigration certainly reflect, and I agree with what has been said earlier, uh, socioeconomic instability, uh, maybe cultural insecurities, but they are adopted, and this is where the problem is, they are adopted by mainstream political parties. And they are also uh, uh, implemented by far-right governments, for instance, in, in, in Europe. So I started with a map of empires, but if we look at this contemporary map that shows how restrictions to international mobility are currently designed and implemented, the, similar, the similarities are very striking. Mobility for some and immobility for others. So I'm going to try to conclude on a positive note. So, and, and the question is, okay, what can we improve in Canada? Because our immigration policies have considerably improved but are not and far from being perfect. So we can improve, for instance, refugee policies in order to integrate refugees faster and better. And I, I, I'm going to, to provide examples maybe later. We can also improve uh, the labor rights of migrant workers who have considerably less labor rights than the rest of the Canadian population. And we have basically different categories of labor rights in Canada. Uh, so this is something we can work on. Another thing we can do is to repeal discriminatory policies against disabled migrants and their families. And this is a 200-year-old policy that has been repealed in other countries, not in Canada. And finally, what you can do is to watch this movie, which is a Canadian movie, Monsieur Lazare, which will make you proud of being Canadian and proud of welcoming refugees and immigrants. Thank you. Well, uh, folks, we have, uh, we've come to the end of our time. You've seen this. I think our panel has done a marvelous job in, in framing the issues and sort of that showing that interplay between optimism and pessimism. And uh, I'd just like you to join me in thanking, the, thanking our panel.